shed I have two suitcases these suitcases were bought in the 1970s by my parents they actually bought a whole set of matching suitcases um, that went from a little bag you could put on your shoulder to a whole range like almost like uh, the, the three bears of suitcases you know you've, you've got you know daddy bear suitcase mommy bear suitcase and then a little baby bear suitcase I have retained I think, um, mommy bear and baby bear. And my plan on this video was to go down to my shed and pull those two suitcases out because they are resplendent. They represent the height of eloquence and sophistication back in the 70s where you would have a matching set of, um, of, um, of suitcases. And these suitcases are sky blue. They're all padded. And they look like a pair of 70s platform shoes. They're, they're looking fantastic. And I wanted to start this video with that aesthetic. The same aesthetic that, that embodies so many bands on this video. But why did I want to do that? Why did I want to get those suitcases? Well, because those suitcases are full of cassette tapes. They're full of cassette tapes of tracks I mixed when... I had my little Porter Studio studio back in the early 90s. We, there must be about 600 hours of recordings there. 600 hours, which is huge. There's a huge amount of product that I created as a young guy obsessed by music. But it's nowhere near the 10,000 hours required to become a master, is it? So those suitcases, you can almost hold them up and they would re represent the work that you need to do to become a musician, the idea of the 10,000 hours. And I was going to do a very uh, intellectual, philosophical take where I would look at these suitcases and what they represent in the aesthetics, aesthetics embodied in, you know, the suitcase, fas suitcase fashion. And then look at the idea of creativity and explore the idea of the 10,000 hours. You know, which I think is a load of rubbish. I'm going to debunk on this video the idea of the 10,000 hours because I can't think it, I don't think it's true. And it gets used by people, especially like positive thinking people trying to sell an idea of what creativity is, which skews the idea of what creativity is. Right. So before I get into this, I'll tell you what actually happened. So I, 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 I'm, I'm working out what I'm going to say. I'm getting all the concepts. I'm pulling it together. I love this idea of random strands. I love the idea of exploring an idea and taking another idea and throwing it into the mix, right? And I, I like the idea of looking at the way fashion changes and the difference between fashion and creativity. But I need the suitcases. I need them. You know, there's going to be a comic moment when I show them because they do look so ridiculous. So I went down to my shed and I haven't been down my shed for a long time. In fact, I haven't really been down the bottom of the garden for a long time. I've had a lot on my plate, a lot on my plate. The idea that I could have taken 10,000 hours now to become whatever creative person I want to become, I wouldn't have been able to. So I haven't been down the bottom of the garden. You know, so I go down the bottom of the garden and it's a, I'm a little bit like Frodo when he has to go into that um, Shelob's lair. You know that thing when he's hacking his way through and he... And he's looking, and there's spider webs everywhere because um, my shed has become a no-go area because of the um, the spiders that inhabit it. I call don't I don't call it a shed. I call it Spidertopolis. Um, and the spiders um, they rule that kingdom. And I thought, getting up as a fifty-six year old, I thought, go and get those suitcases. Yeah, there might be a few big spiders on them, but you'll be all right. You know, you know, just go and get them. Just brush them off, you know, just drop in there, grab them, pull them out. You, can, you know, you need to get, you've got all your cassette tapes in there, you know, you need to have a look at them. And also, I've got a few of the cassette tapes I bought in the 1980s. And um, 
I wanted to get those out and put them here again of this idea of who we are and where we come from and the aesthetics that have influenced my age group. This is the whole idea of this. When I open the thing, I, in fact, I go up to the shed door and I look at the lock and the lock is encrusted in spider webs. And I open the door very subreptitiously and I see a few scatter. And I look and under a whole bunch of spider webby boxes right at the back of the shed um, were the two suitcases. I could see them. Now, I could have perhaps fashioned some sort of hook on a stick and pulled them out using that method. But I looked at it and I thought, nah. And as I shut that shed up, I had the feeling that I would probably never venture into it again. And whatever is contained in there, and there's a lot of stuff contained in there, all sorts of different things. Probably in the future at some point, I will just burn it down like the wicker man with the spiders inside screaming. <clears throat> Along with it, the emblematic um, symbol of the amount of work I did as a young man. Right, the 10,000 hours that I put in, right, embodied with this bloody bunch of cassette tapes that will never, ever really be listened to now. I mean, if I could, well, I haven't even got a cassette player to play them on, but if I did have, right, um, it would just, I don't think I'm going to live long enough to get through them all. It's literally, um, it could well be six, I just want to know, I'm, I don't know. This is something that I have and it's a little bit like this, like it's almost like a picture of Dorian Gray, isn't it? Sat in my shed, a representation of my youth and what I did. Um, you know, I know that if I pull those 70 suitcases out, the, the suitcases that were bought in 1978 so uh, my family could take their first foreign holiday to Malta and my mum bought out the catalogue these things. It embodies that time when I was discovering music and getting motivated by music. And I was motivated to go out and uh, start doing stuff. So let's go on the history of these cassette tapes. Let's tell you all about that. I'm a musician. I'm playing lots of music. I'm into Prague. I'm into Jazz Fusion, as you all know. Right. In 1986, I left school and I went to college, university, or as it was then Polytechnic. And Polytechnic was just basically a university for common people. So I went to a Polytechnic, uh, Wolverhampton Polytechnic, which was great. Or It was actually called Polytechnic Wolverhampton. And um, studied art. That was my academic background, was fine art, and I was a painter. Um, throughout this period, um, I, I, I was... As much interested in art and aesthetics and film, my dissertation was in French New Wave film. The great Alain Delon died uh, two days ago. You know, one of the great French actors, somebody I'd studied quite a lot and possibly one of the most handsome men ever to exist. <laughs> one of the coolest blokes. And this meme's been going round about, uh, you know, it's like a picture of Marianne Faithful, and on one side you've got Mick Jagger, and the other side is Alan Delon, and he's obviously chatty, got Marianne, Marianne Faithful, and it's working, you want to look on his face. And uh, Mick Jagger looks very sullen and bloated, and looks like a weird, you know, sort of clown puppet thing, sat there all despondent. Um, yeah, this video is really going all through these different subjects. And, and my job is to try and pull this all together. And how can I? You know, but I, I have faith in the aesthetic. It will get pulled together. Trust me. I haven't got a way of doing it. But the great creative God is going to descend on this video. You watch. And I'm predicting it right now. 70s suitcase. Loads of cassette tapes of recorders you made. Doing a degree in art, Alan Delon died, Mick Jagger looking like a sullen clown. What does all this mean? So, I finish my degree in fine art. And uh, I've now go, got to go and get a job. And I spent a year on the dole trying to get a job. Eventually, I ended up in a drawing office. It was actually a landscape architect called Gillespie's. And as a, as a, a sort of youngster that I had had longer I'd had all my hair down here and I'd had it all cut short for this interview and it was all pushed back like this and I had my suit on and I walked him in my portfolio and um, they 
back in that time, 91, 92, there was a little bit of a recession going on. And um, it, it, it was difficult to get jobs. And I got a degree in art and nobody wanted me. You know, I can remember going for an interview for working stacking shelves in this little local shop and the bloke said, why have you come here? I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got a degree. He said, I ain't gonna apply, employ anybody with a degree. I didn't have anyone stacking shelves with a degree. And I, I went, I'm so depressed. Depressing time, really, it was. So that's the backdrop, the backdrop, you know. Two themes have emerged, haven't they, in this video early on. Anxiety, the fear of the big spiders, the fear of the spider coming over and taking over, and depression, you know, and feeling like you're a failure. Two, you know, universal drives almost motivate are they motivations is there such a thing as negative motivation you know poor old mick jagger he's he's a cool guy he's copied all these black singers here he is and he's pretty cool everything everyone thinks he's sliced bread and he, you know he, he, he's sat there thinking he's the best thing he's the bee's knees he's got marion faithful in there you know he's um what's the word he's punching above his station is that the saying and he thinks he's the bee's knees and then alan delon walks in the embodiment of the Superman, the coolest French film star, talented man, but also a handsome man. Are these motivators? So maybe that's the theme that's coming out. Motivation, park that in your mind as we go into the contents of my 70s suitcases. So I eventually get a job in this drawing office by basically begging them I can remember I did this interview and they were looking at me and they they didn't know whether to have me you know they wanted somebody cheap but they wanted someone who could do the technical drawing so they couldn't employ somebody I didn't know this back then I was a naive little kid but they couldn't employ someone on proper money to be a to do the the drawing because of this recession that's going on but they need someone who can do the drawing but anyway um my gut feeling told me to stand up and I went over and pointed to the drawing and I said I can do that. I promise you I can do that. And the boss looked up to me. And when I got home, a couple of days later, a letter came through and I beat out about 80 applicants and I got the job. So I was working in this drawing office. Could I do technical drawing? No. Did I learn to do it? Yes. Why? Because I was bolted to a table and they were paying me. Okay? Park that idea. Um, the recession gets to a certain point that they need to sack someone. And we get told two people will be sacked from the uh, from the office. So everyone's terrified. Typical managerial technique. They're all walking around terrified. Oh, well, don't leave me. Don't want to do it. You know, and all that's going on. And um, I, at this point, have now grown my hair long. I no longer wear a suit. Um, I'm in bands. I'm going out and gigging. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm staying out late. I'm coming back like hungover, you know, from various houses. I've slept on the floor. I'm slouching in. Um, I'm a musician. All the other drawing tables are all neat. Mine is all covered all over. This. I've got posters of Gong and all this sort of stuff all over the place. It's a right mess. And um, I get the call from the boss and he pulls me and he says, we're going to have to let you go, Andy. And I said, why? And he says, because you don't want to be here. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's obvious. He said, um, you don't want to be here. You're not going to become a landscape architect. We offered to train you up and you didn't want to do it. He says, you're a musician. Why, you, why don't you do that? And I said, well, there's no, you can't get a job as a musician. It's too hard. And he turned around and, and um, said the immortal, he goes, immortal things. And he said, <laughs> this guy turned around and said, well, my brother's one of the bosses of EMI and he's made a lot of money out of music. So my boss, who sat there and seemed like a very stuffy, uncool person, like the enemy to me, was saying to me to go and do music. That's what I was told. I uh, went downstairs. I, I, I literally got a sack. I mean, I literally did get the sack and I picked up the sack and I went to my table and I scraped all the bits I wanted and stuck it over my shoulder and got in my car and I drove off. And I'm now driving home. I've got no job no money, I'm going to have to go and live at my mum and dad's. And as I'm driving along, I can remember, got away and everyone had been upset and by Andy, I was really good and I was ashamed it was you and I went, don't worry, I'll, I'll be all right. And all that stuff had gone. And as I drive off and driving down the road and I'm like this. Yes! <laughs> and at that point, a decision was made. I was going to be a musician. At that point, 1992, 32 years ago, 
Uh, the next day I got in my car and I drove to a music shop and I walked in and I said, I want everything that you've got so I can have a recording studio in my house, in my mom and dad's bedroom that they'd let me have. Um, I'd got... I got a sum of money off them because I was made redundant, although it felt like I'd had the sack, but I was made redundant. So I had 2,000 quid. And that was a lot of money back in 1992. So I went down with this two grand and I bought everything I need. I bought guitars and cables and microphone stands and, and microphones. I bought um, outboard effects. I bought some guitar pedal effects. I bought them. Um, um, I actually had a guitar at that point. So I had a little amp and I bought a Tascam. I think 424 recording studio. And unlike the time before the when I'd been on the doll, this time I just signed on. But then every morning I would get up and go into my studio and I would record. I would record and record and record every single day. That is all I did. OK, I was a pretty good drummer. I was quite a good guitarist. I could play. But now I was... Um, faced with this thing of having to write music which I'd never done before but my motivation to do this was so strong before this I used to um, get a cassette tape and I'd put it in my bedroom and I'd drum along to it like this just drum along to anything then I'd get the cassette tape and I'd play it and I would put my other cassette tape and, with a little built-in microphone and I'd put my acoustic guitar and play along to the drumming Right, and then I might overdub some percussion, that's all I had. And I'd made these tapes up, these three generation tapes, jumping across, physically recording them and trying to get the sound right. And um, I had all these tapes that I'd made like that. My motivation to do this was unbelievably strong. I'd spent all my money on it. And the day I got that four, four track studio, I can remember I did that. I, I put two mics on the drum kit. Uh, one just one mic above and one in front in front of the bass drum and I recorded down about five minutes of drumming I didn't think, didn't think what I was doing put five you know five minutes down of drumming then I rewound it back I plugged this bass in that I bought and I put a bass line down and then I put um, a guitar part down and I bought I got this little Casio CZ101 which is a fantastic digital keyboard but it's like you could mini manipulate the sounds and I was running that through a bunch of effects and I put this keyboard solo down and I was so, as I hit play and heard the sound, which had no structure, I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever heard in my life. I can remember it to this day. I then plugged my drum machine in and recorded a drum machine loop down and made another track. I couldn't believe it. I mixed the tracks off. Um, I had a mate called Ian Stonehouse at the time, who was a big Frank Zappa fan, and he knew about recording. And I'd been picking his brains. So with the manual and him telling me how you could record, I was able to get something recorded and mix. And I mixed it off to a cassette tape, and I went off to see my girlfriend at the time. And I can remember arriving and saying, listen to this. And I played it in their living room for everybody. And everyone sat around listening to it, because nobody else could go off and make a track in their bedroom. And they go, what's this? I said, I've just made it. How have you made it? What's going on? I've just made it. And I then had the accolades of everyone going, oh, that's amazing. What? How? I didn't know you could play everything and all that type of stuff. Yeah. It was nonsense. It was just weird sort of, you know, almost like the Grateful Dead, just a jam. Um, and so I got, I got sort of, people thought it was great. This motivation is a mixture of all sorts of things. And the key to understanding creativity is to understand that creativity, which requires talent, the talent is the drive to do it. When someone's born with a talent, they have a motivation and a drive to do it. They have a love of doing it. So you have to examine why they love doing it so much. And if you look at the elements that I've... Um, discussed in the video so far what we see is uh, you know there's a tendency to human beings to get depressed and that's because they compare themselves to other people and when you do music and art you 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 engage in that, that comparison it, it often ends up in perfectionism but the point is is you feel bad about yourself and you're wretched but you can have a break from the feeling bad about yourself by getting in there and being in the moment playing. And then when you finished it and put it out there, someone might come along and say, you know, this is really good. And it's equivalent of 
uh, Mick Jagger, a, a, an ugly bloke, but a very charismatic bloke, suddenly this guy did realise that all the girls love him and he can pull ladies like Marianne Faithful. And that's, that's him. He's, he's all boosted up by that. And then Alan Delon walks in and he goes, oh, God, look at him. Right? That is a motivator to creativity. The spiders, the anxiety, the thing, there's things around it that can get you, that can pull you down, that your life could fall into chaos. You know, you could end up dying because you forgot to tie your shoelaces at a certain point. That anxiety, again, is assuaged by the, um, in the momentness of making music. The, the being in the now, depression and anxiety are two states where our, 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 um, our being is either too much in the future or anxiety is or too much in the past, right? I think creativity um, is... Creative people are motivated by those two things. Now... If we throw things like ADHD and if we throw things like autism and all these things about being on the spectrum, all this type of stuff, and you throw that in, you can then look at the psychology that affects those types of people when they get into the sort of too much future thinking or too much uh, rear thinking. And, and they suffer with it far more. And so this drives them to do stuff. Autism often creates a sort of focus on things completely. Now, I was without doubt like that from the age of about 14. I was every day did six hours drum practice and then four hours guitar practice. But when I got my Porter studio, it was just continual. It was, I would just, what I would do was spend, it was more towards the weekend I would do stuff. I was doing stuff all week, but um, when the weekend came, I would, um, no, I've got that the wrong way around. The weekend I used to go off up to see my friends. It was in the week um, that I would work just all day and on. And then when I got to it, I would mix these tapes off. And it got to the point where nobody was listening to them anymore. I would just mix off everything I did. And I put the cassette tape in and I wrote down the date and what it was. And I just dropped it in to this suitcase. And there's literally 300, 400, could be 600, could be 800 cassette tapes just full of stuff I created. Now, most of it's rubbish. It's, it's all nonsense. Absolutely nonsense. But loads of... <laughs> it was just loads of hours put in. Now, um, if you click on the link of this video, it will take you to an album on Bandcamp. And that is an album of some of the tracks that I've still got because some of these tapes I transferred, the best ones I transferred to Minidisc, and then a few years back, I was able to pull those mini discs out and pull out some of the tracks off those tapes and master them. And there is a cassette. Uh, sorry, there's an album on Bandcamp and you can go and check it out and you can hear all these mad tracks. And when I go back and listen to those tracks, they have an exuberance and a love of experimentation and an av avant-gardeness, which is so anarchic that I cannot capture anymore. Partially because I am so much more adept and knowledgeable than I was then. I mean, back then I had no idea of harmony. I was playing weird time signatures, but I didn't really know how to do it. You know, I didn't know how to produce. I didn't know how to write a tune. But the fact was, that was the point when I was learning. That was the point when I put the 10,000 hours in. So on the last half of this video, I now want to critique this idea of 10,000 hours. Of course, putting the work in will make you great. But we have to ask the question, what makes you put the work in? And what makes you put the work in is motivation. And motivation can come in two forms, positive motivation and negative motivation. And I'm afraid creative people are motivated on the whole by negative motivation. Right, and all those positive thinking types, all those people out there trying to sell that idea to you, they're, they're all fakers. And I'll tell you why. Because negative motivation will always prompt positive motivation. If I come to you and said, you need to spend the next year writing a book, and it needs to be a book about beetles, not the band, the insects. I want you to research it all. People who researched it all, they've done so much research. I want you to do that. I'm not doing that. Oh, it'll take a lot. It's going to take a long time. I just don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm going to pay you a million quid. 
Now, it's feasible that you would start and you're like, you're, this is positive motivation. I want the million quid. If I get that, all, all my life will change. All the future that I've got in front of me will change. It will all be brilliant. It's, it's like the dream of becoming a rock and roll star. It'd be brilliant if I get the million quid. Absolutely fantastic. I'll do this. But then you realise you've got to go to the library and you've got to really hold encyclopedias and you can't do it. Oh, this is too hard. I've got to remember all these Latin names. It's too hard. I can't do it. And it could be feasible that you either fail at it or at a certain point you go, look, what is the point in doing this? I don't even know if it's going to succeed. There's other people writing books about it. I can't beat the competition. They're better at it than me. Is this really going to happen? Am I actually going to... Am I going to get this million quid? You know something? I'm not going to live like this. I'm, I, I don't care about the million quid. I'm going to go back to having a decent life. This is an absolute nonsense. Now, that decision, I think, is a very important decision for creative people to make. And I may talk about it on this video. But the point is, the million quid is motivating. But it's not completely motivating. Now, if you then come along and say you've got to write the book, and if it's not written after a year... We're going to send a hitman out on you and you will be killed, right? Unless you are so depressed that that's what you want to happen, I think you would do it, right? And not only would you do it, you would do it badly. And from this comes the phrase, if something is worth doing, and writing a book to save your life is worth doing, then it's worth doing badly, which I think is a paraphrase of G.K. Chesterton, because I've said this phrase before and a clever person said that in the comments. Thank you, GK Chesterton, if that is the case. So we have positive and we have negative motivation. The negative motivation for creative people is the uh, mental issues I have outlined. It's being anxious and depressed. And I think it's exacerbated by having a tendency to be on the spectrum and a tendency towards ADHD. ADHD is not the ability to not focus. It's, it's the ability on, to not focus on things that you don't like. And if you want to know <laughs> somebody who's like that, it's me. Right. <laughs> I've got quite a successful YouTube. I have produced originally three videos a week and then four videos a week. And now I'm also almost producing a video every single day. I have done that for three years without fail. Why? Because my brain is immensely focused. But the detriment of this is um, like yesterday, I suddenly realised I hadn't taxed my car and I got into the whole thing and I had a massive panic because the car wasn't taxed and I'm driving around an untaxed car. And so I had to get on and tax it. So I needed a VN11 form. So I searched how I've lost the VN11 form. I can't find that. So then I have to find the long book and get a number at them. And by the time I've got that all done, I've been in a panic. Right? If this rings true, this is the creative curse. Right? I'm scatty. My thought processes are all over the place. When I'm focused on something, I'm focused on it completely. My brain is always going all the time. Um, I have ability to take concepts and turn them over and, 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 and line them up. I have ability to be able to, you know, think tracks through. I can wake up in the morning and I have a whole track in my head and all I have to do is go down to my studio and just play down the stuff that's in my head. I, I, I think very visually. So um, when I'm, con you know, conceptualising something, I will conceptualise the look of it. And all these things have been perfect for YouTube, it's enabled me to pull something off. My friends see it and they want to do it and they start and they get five videos in and then they collapse. They can't keep it up. Right? I can. Right? And in that, I'm knowing enough to realise that that is the fundamental theme of these videos. If you're sat there watching this one, you're one of the hardcore people. You're probably a creative artist. You know what you're going to get on a philosophy video. And I'm able to talk about it in a way where you go, this is actually quite interesting. You know why? Because I got a job and it was one of the few jobs I could do because I can't do a normal job. But I got a job in a college back when colleges were more freer and you were able to actually teach rather than just assess. 
I was able to stand up for hours on end. I've done my 10,000 hours in front of students and I've been faced with the problem of how do you help somebody who wants to be a creative musician? And I realised colleges sell an idea. They sell this idea of the rock dream and then the kids come in and the staff walk around going, oh, that person's not going to make it. That person's not going to make it. I didn't make it. The whole thing is rotten. The whole thing is rotten. But I, with my on the spectrum ADHD brain full of anxiety and depression, I was able to take that idea and turn it around. And I was able to, rather than teach, to listen. And I've had 30 years talking to kids and going, how do you solve this problem? How do you solve the ability to make it? And what is making it? And here on this video, I am dealing with this idea that you will have to put the hours in. Now, if you tell somebody that, right, what they will do if they're a creative person is they will do this. And this here, and I've said it before on the channel, but some of you may not have heard this. This cr creates two concepts which are absolutely destructive to the creative person. The first one, of course, is I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Why am I bothering to do this? Other people have put in 10,000 hours. There's this 10,000, I haven't put 10,000 hours is Maybe I'm not very good because I haven't put the 10,000 hours in. I'm just not good enough. And other people, they put the 10,000 hours in and they're good. Look at Andy, he's posted about all stuff. I mean, he plays all the instruments. He said he did six hours a day, six hours a day on the drums and then four hours a day on the guitar. And then he bought his port steward but every hour of the day making music and I, he probably started off crap to start off with but if you're doing it every single day then you get good at it then because you've done that and you've got those skills you can get a job in a college teaching music and then he's had all these hours and hours in front of kids trying to help them and he's learned oh, did he, what he say i haven't had that i'm not like that i haven't had that i'm just not good enough i'm not good enough that idea will stop this process from happening the ten thousand hours aren't going to happen if you feel like that right nobody starts to climb the mountain looking at the mountain they climb the mountain because there's these lovely tasty sweets that go up the mountain and they go oh that's a lovely tasty sweet and that's a lovely one. before they know it they're at the top of the mountain creative people are motivated they need to play but they also need to create something and worry about how they're gonna look that's so important and that's destructive in itself that's that i'm not good enough because inside that is the hope that you are good enough. I know I'm not good enough, but I'll do this recording. Oh, I, I'm not going to put it out there. But Andy said, you've got to put your recordings out there. So I will put it out there. You know, somebody might like it. Oh, that would make me feel great. That, that would counteract the demons of me thinking I hate, I'm rubbish and I hate the self and all the self-loathing. Right, so that's a big factor that you've got to deal with as a creative person. The 10,000 hours thing does not help that. Of course, you need to put the time in. All right, but is it 10,000 hours? No. What it is, it is the amount of activity of doing the right things. If you're doing the right things, it won't take 10,000 hours. Okay, but before we get into that, I want to get into on the other aspect. The other thing that will stop you doing it is this thought. Well, I know I'm all right. If you've got past that, I'm now pretty good and I'm doing good stuff. But what's the point? There's so many people out there. They're all doing their stuff. You know, everyone goes on about this. Like, a, There's a billion tracks of loads of Spotify. It's mainly full of tracks by bands that no one's going to listen to. No one's going to listen to what I do. I mean, I put that track on Bandcamp. The only list of people who listened to it was my mum and my dentist because I told him about it. And I think when he went to it, he thought, what the hell's this? This guy's a weirdo. Why is he doing this in his spare time? He should sort himself out and become a dentist like me. He'd do a proper job fixing people's teeth. I mean, people's teeth, they're going to get fillings because they like those sweets, especially the ones who are walking up the mountain eating all the sweets. And they get all they have to have the fillings, don't they? They have to have the fillings. And then I'm here and I do the filling. You know, I've I, 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 I got a productive role in society. Why should this person be allowed to go off and do all these nice things like being creative? I mean, I, I like playing tennis, but I'm not a professional tennis player, aren't I? Sometimes people just got to realise that they can't do these things. Um, what I just said then, I was told by my doctor... I went to my doctor with severe anxiety and back then I was having a lot of anxiety around touring and playing in bands. I, I, I developed a problem, which is what I, why I stopped touring in 2009. That's one of the reasons why. And I went to my doctor to talk to them about this and they turned around and said, well, 
I wanted to be a professional t tennis player, but in the end, you can't ha do it, what you have to do. You've just got to walk away from it. And I remember thinking, she doesn't know who I am, because at this point, I was still pretty old, and I'd done some reasonable stuff. And I, but the point was, by this time, I'd realised that music's a curse. Creativity is a curse. You're cursed with it. The reason is because you've got these mental defects. And the way to deal with these mental defects is in the way I'm saying you have to position yourself in a certain point and you do have control over that. So first of all, you have to banish those two demons, right? The thing about being good, you'll be get good. You will get good. You will be get, you will be gat. I'm talking in biblical terms. You will get good because you, um, you see, I'm not a good YouTuber. I, I, but the thing that helped me with YouTube, because when I started, if something like that happened, I would stop and start again. And then I left a few mistakes in and I started to roll with the punches. Um, now, the other day I said that phrase, roll with the punches, and then I, th I think it was that phrase. And then I carried on saying, you've got to roll with the punches to get to what's clear. But anyway, I said something like that. It might not have been that. Can you see how confused I am, right? I'm trying to make the point that the other day I said this phrase and it was a line that David Lee Roth has said. So I just said it because it was in my head. And then somebody said, oh, that's great. You quote me, David Lee Roth. As though I'm very clever, but I'm not. I am literally just rolling with the punches all the time. But I'm watching... I'm watching the mistakes and I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I'm working with them. I said at the outset of this video, that was precisely what I was going to do, right? And I've done it and I've talked through a bunch of themes and these themes relate. If you go back through it, what I'm talking about, which is this idea of fashion, this idea that you can look at a suitcase which is worth money, but now it's in a shed rotting. And why is it rotting? Because nobody wants a sky blue suitcase with orange and green stripes on it. Nobody wants that with huge, great big belt buckles that like look like something, you know, that a pirate ha would have around their waist, you know. But nobody wants that. All padded and all fat, you know. Nobody wants that. But they did at one point. So fashion is one of the things that demotivates you, that the idea that, oh, I do not make... Um, uh, stuff that people like anymore i'm you know this is the old person's problem of going you know i do want to create but like i'm an old bloke who's interested in 70s suitcases because that's what my music's going to be like that demotivates you right your fear your anxiety your fear of of being judged to people thinking that you're rubbish will depress will stop you the idea that you have um they've got these things in your past where you failed and you won't be able to get these things will all stop you but the thing that will motivate you is the awareness that you have to do it because it's your personality that you are cursed to do it and it has to be done. And once you realise that, then you realise you need to be able to sustain what you do. And the way you sustain what you do is by being very wise. And I do try on this channel sometimes to explain how that is the case, how to do that. And I've become pretty good at doing that, I think. Um, but what what is much more important at the start is to sustain yourself going around the circle of creativity because that is a process and getting your stuff out there right so um i have got to the point where i do these videos and i do not judge whether they're any good or not um, as time has gone on i have learned doing these youtube videos that if you just open yourself up to what's around you and start talking if you have an idea you want to say, but you get that mix and you bang in some things that you don't really understand, new ideas, you bang those and you start to talk them, talk through them, that will twist. It will be like an X factor that you put in. that If you think about it and solve it, will uncover truths deeper than you could have thought of. All right. And, uh, the one that really strikes me, and I will put it up again now, is that photograph of Mick Jagger with Alan Delon and Marion Faith. Well, have a look at it. Have a look. I'll move over so we can get it right. Look at it. Right? That embodies everything I'm talking about. That is what a creativity comes from. That is where it comes from. Do you understand that? 
it's not being a good person and being disciplined and being able to put 10,000 hours in. And believe me, there are a lot of disciplined musicians who have put 10,000 hours in. And their time has come because they're all over YouTube and Instagram showing off their virtuosity. But they are not creative people. There is no artistic worth to anything they're doing at all. All right. Same as these sort of anal retentive YouTubers that come on sat in front of their albums and just go through relaying what they think about it and all the facts that they can remember. There is no point in that whatsoever. They uh, do not understand. They are not creative people. They have not stopped to think, why do people like prog? Why are people watching me? What is it about them? What are they like? And what's driving them to find out why do they want to know about a ranking? And the reason why they want to know about a ranking because they want to understand what is good and what is not good. And they want to check themselves what they think against what they perceive as an expert to see if um, what they think adds up. It's like a communal thing of seeing where we're, if we're on the same page. And if people think they're on the same page as you, they will like you and they will subscribe. I know that, and I know that is a cheap thing. I realised that many years ago on this channel where I decided to do my top 10 biscuits to sort of lampoon and parody the very thing. But I know it brings people here and I do not denounce it because I will do the same thing. I'll be trying on YouTube to try and look at something intellectual. And then a band I like, Return to Forever, the 10 Return to Forever albums ranked. Except nobody ever does that because I'm the one who does that. <laughs> so, you know, so if you want to see those, you know, some people, I mean, old Pete Pardo will have done it. He's ranked everything. I, I don't think there's a, I mean, he's invented bands to rank now, isn't he? As we said the other day, that's a joke. It's a parody. This, the parody, the jokes, the deep philosophy, the ranking videos, the clickbait, it's all about quality. And the reason why I do it is because it's motivating. Talking about music, listening to music, being with your mates and experiencing music, playing music is all motivating. It's a break. It's a break from the norm. But the idea that it's going to take you 10,000 hours to get good, there is no good. The message of the video. There is no good. Good. There is no point of arrival. There is no clock ticking where you are crap. And then that day when you get up and you finally cross the finishing line of 10,000 hours and some, you emerge like a creative phoenix into the world does not exist. Right. Click on those tapes I did that are now residing in a spider filled shed at the bottom of my garden and have a listen to them. And ask yourself, is this any better or any worse than the music I make now? And what you'll come up, you'll go, no, it's just different. It's a young Andy. It's a naive Andy. But it's full of a quality that he hasn't got now. But he's got something else now. Right? And that voyage through life, you can document. And at a certain point... People would be able to appreciate your wisdom or skill because you would have put the time in, the 10,000 hours, or it could have been 4,000 hours, it could be 20,000 hours, because you have to do the right stuff. You have to go about it in the right way. There are things about being creative that are intuitive, and you will naturally do them, but there are things that are counterintuitive. For example, listening to the demon that says you're not very good, right? And then acting on it and then going, I'm not going to put this out into the world because it's not good enough yet. Right. And that will stunt you. And the 10,000 hours, if they even exist, you will not clock your way through. Right. But that is counterintuitive. Right. A job of a teacher. And this was my biggest realisation was I thought these kids come in, they sit in front of me, all the intuitive stuff they've got right, but the counterintuitive stuff. <laughs> they don't know about it. I've got to teach it them, but it's a bitter pill to to swallow. Right. So, for example, if you're educating someone as a they're a musician, the one of the things I realised as I, I used to say to them, at the moment you're a music fan and you're such a music fan that you've bought yourself a guitar you, and you've learnt some tracks by Metallica. You're a music fan, but you're not a musician. You just own a guitar. 
You've now got to become a musician. And to become a musician, you have to listen to things that you don't like to expand your ability to create. But you don't like think, listening to things you don't like. Plus, you have built an ideology around that where you're part of the tribe and you can't like it. And if I play a track that I think you need to listen to, if you're a guitarist and you've learned lo lo loads of Kirk Hammett guitar solos, but I can't hear any feel in there, and I'm saying you should really go and listen to B.B. King or Steve Ray Vaughan, and you don't like it because it's not Metallica, you need to open your ears and stop being like that. And once you're opening your ears and go searching rather than thinking that you've arrived and you know everything, is the point when you'll start to learn. So I'm going to play you some B.B. King. And the way I'm going to get you to think that B.B. King's good is because us older teachers around you are going to say, tell you they're good and it's important and hopefully if I've, you've de developed a level of respect for what I say and my technical abilities then you will then go I should really listen to this and I've got to be honest deep down I do like it it is actually pretty good <laughs> this that is the one of the educational processes that I used to use on my students, right? How do you measure this? You can't measure it. This is why the whole education system's gone down the pan because they don't understand it. No one's going to put on anybody who knows about creativity or aesthetics in charge. And most teachers don't understand aesthetics or creativity because they're failures, right? So they've ended up in this job and a lot of people aren't creative that do music anyway. So we come to... The biggest thing that I'm about to say as we get deeper and deeper into truth. And that is, if you're ready for this one, music's a curse. It's like being damned. Life is bad enough as it is, but trying to be creative and sustain your creativity is a difficult thing to do. If you dip your toe in it, then what you should be doing is trying to find out whether it's for you. And for most people, it's not. And if you are just a person that likes to play your Metallica tracks and try and get exactly the same as the record, you're not a creative person. It's a hobby and keep it as a hobby. But if this starts to ring true, the mental health issues and all that stuff, so not the 10,000 hours, because that's nonsense. But if what I've said, you're sat there going, and he's right, he's right, no one's ever said this, he's right, he's right, he's right. If you are sat there doing this, you have to do it and you've got no choice. If you're not, then you have been let off and you can now leave the room and go and do a normal job and have a nice house and have a life that's stress-free. So off you go. Bye. Yeah, I've told you to go. I've told you to go. Yeah, I'm, yeah I, know, I, know, I know you like Metallica and you've come here. I ain't going to ever do a Metallica ranking. No, you, you just go, go. Right, they've gone. You lot that are left, where are you? I always look at myself when I'm doing this, don't I? So I'm looking at myself now, but my eyes are going to the side. That's a mistake I make. I try my hardest to not do it. But if, I, if I'm conscious, I can do it. So I'm now looking at you lot here. Hello. How are you? You're all nutters, aren't you? You're weirdos. You've been weirdos since you were a kid, aren't you? And life's been difficult, full of all sorts of angst and troubles. No one's ever really understood who you are. Right, you know there's something in there, but you've never been able to really fulfil it because you just were plagued by demons who told you you weren't good enough and because you thought that there was too much competition. But now you've got to an age where you realise you had wished you'd had a go at it because it pains you and you don't want to go to the grave not being creative. So, Andy, can you tell us what to do? Right, forget the 10,000 hours, right? Decide what you want to do and do it and finish it off. Paint your painting, write your poem, Record your record. If you cannot do it because you are unskilled, then find somebody who could do that for you and pay them, right? But if you can't afford it, you are going to have to learn to do that thing yourself. And you're going to have to learn to do it badly because you can't off start off doing it well. Did I just... I just thought... Did I spit in? <laughs> Right, get back on track, Andy, because this is like the most important thing you ever told anybody. Right, um, find a way of doing it. If you don't know how to do it, it's because it's counterintuitive and you cannot work it out. So ask somebody, right? For example, me, right? And if loads of people were to ask me, I would set up a club. 
I would take your money for doing it because I'm not going to do this and give this away for nothing, right? I'm going to expect something in return and you've got to learn that because that's how the music industry works, right? You are going to have to, that's the mountain you're going to have to climb and you're going to have to climb it, but it's worth it because there's loads of little sweets if you look down and see them and you bite them off one by one. You make your art, you put it out there, you find the structures to get it out there. And then once you've done, you sit back and you see how it lands. The tiny little ripples at the start, they're only tiny ripples. But those ripples will grow because you will do it again. And there's your 10,000 hours. And if you do this correctly, you might find that your aesthetic is actually very easy to get to. You don't have to be technically brilliant to be creatively brilliant. But for some people, they do. And it's different for everybody, right? A classical piano virtuoso probably does have to put 10,000 hours in. But art is not like that. Because art contains the conceptual and it contains the visceral. And visceral can be done without chops. And conceptual can be done without chops. It depends on what you decide to do. And you need to know what you want to do. You need to know who you're about and, and who you are and what the art is that you make. And you have to find out whether people like it. And they might not like it. And then what are you going to do? I tell you what you're going to do. You're still going to carry on because it's not about you being a success. It's not about people liking you. It's about people sustaining your creativity. And everybody who lives in a free liberal democracy where there's freedom of expression can do that we all could do it we can find a circular way and a process that we can sit in and know that we are in that process and make stuff and go around the circle and it's not a circle it's a corkscrew that will twist through time through your life and take you from the beginning to the end and you'll be a creative person for the whole of your life which you have to be and you have no choice that is what you need to realise. And if the demons are arguing against anything I'm saying, you need to put it into the comments because I, for some reason, the way fate has, has gone, I have a, a compulsion to try and help people in this situation. I don't know why. Don't know why. Probably because it makes me feel better about myself. Who knows? 10,000 hours, load of rubbish. Forget about it. Think about motivation, right? Think what motivates you. Go through the process and get motivated and start doing it. Be in the now. Express yourself. Don't hate yourself. Love yourself. Because in the end, that is what being creative will help you to do. Because I have, as I have said over and over again, music is made out of love. And the biggest part of that is the ability to love yourself despite your foibles and faults. Oh, I'm so good, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> He's bigger though, Andy is. He's full of himself, at Andy is. He's full of himself. <laughs> That's his problem. I mean, he does say some quite good stuff, but he knows it, doesn't he? And, he, and then he, he does all that, and it was really emotional. I nearly had a tear in my eye, and at the end of it, he spoiled it all by going, you see his little face with his big, his big, like, um, smug smile. Like that, oh, it was so annoying. I wanted to slap him round the face then. I did. I wanted to slap him round the face. Um, you have to have a bit of gumption. You've got to know what you're doing. How do I know this has been okay? Because I can feel it. I've arrived at a certain point. Right, And the only reason I can do this is because for some reason, following my muse and being crap, go and look at my first videos on YouTube. Nobody watches them anymore. Right, There was one point where I didn't even know how the camera worked and everything was in the dark. I was going through a terrible time. I'm unshaved and everything's a mess. But I kept putting those videos out. I'm ashamed of them now. But I won't delete them because that's the journey through. This is a huge, this is my, this is my masterpiece, this YouTube. This is my epic. When I peg it, right, there's going to be probably two or three thousand videos. It's going to, it, it will be a representation in digital video of the mountain I've climbed in every single aspect. You know, and you could do the same thing. A YouTube be, might, might be what the thing is for you. It might be an Instagram, might be a Bandcamp, might be a Patreon. Might be a Spotify, it might could be anything. I'm here to tell you how to do it. Anyone could do it. The internet democratised creativity, you know that. 
We're living in an incredible age for creativity, but it's a different type of creativity to the hero worshipping creativity, as he puts to Ian Anderson, um, that existed in the 20th century. I could keep talking about this for about eight hours. I've got to stop. I've got too much to say. I've got too much to get across. I'm on fire. I really want to get it across to people so they can be creative. I don't care if you all become a brilliant YouTuber as I, you know, fade from view. I won't because I'm the leader of this movement into the creative 21st century. That's what I am. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I am parodying the other side of the, the uh, coin of creativity, which is when you do something good, you then think you're invincible and you think you've, you've got this special thing and that's what famous people are like. They're all twats. If you like this video, put a like on it. If you want to see some more, you can subscribe, press the subscription button. Um, if you want to become a Patreon, and really the Patreon is getting bigger and bigger, and at some point I can see having so many people that the YouTube just becomes the feeder to Patreon, and I would love to create a tier system and where I can talk to you about this stuff, but also employ very great teachers, because at the moment the education system is just is just pooing out great teachers because they don't want to conform to the nonsense that's going on. And there's a whole host of them. And I would love to create a little digital world where you could sign up, pay a certain amount of money, get certain things like mixing, mastering done, get things like photography done, graphic design by the experts that are in there at a really cheap price. But more importantly, get education because the internet allows you now to go specifically to the skills you need and that's great but what about the skills you don't need this is such a huge subject it is such a huge subject and uh, i will return to it again and again um but unless people sign up to perfect patreon and then nag me and say andy can you do this and do that right but i will do it i will do it i just need to be able to have a structure to carve out the amount of time because at the moment, I can't even get down to the bottom of my garden to tidy up, which is why the spiders are taken over. You know, and it's like at some point, if I'm doing all these YouTube videos and I'm having to keep working and working and you're watching me and then suddenly these huge giant spiders come and pull me into the ground, which is my biggest fear. is like the embodiment of the anxiety that's driven me to be in the first place. Wouldn't that be an irony?